everybody. Welcome. Yeah. So my name is Shelley Rubin. Uh, I'm the founder of A Blade of Grass, which is the host of tonight's program. Uh, a Blade of Grass is a new nonprofit. It's the first of its kind, solely dedicated to nurturing socially engaged art. We're very proud of it and glad that you're all here. We make grants to both organizations and individual artists and also create learning opportunities like this one tonight that you're the most serious audience for, so I know it's gonna be a fabulous night. Just to orient you, you're on the eighth floor. It's a private exhibition and event space created by my husband Donald, who unfortunately is not here right now, and me to promote cultural and philanthropic initiatives. The title of the wonderful exhibition that I did hear some people talking about that you see around you is Waiting for the Idols to Fall, which considers how in the current transition period, Cuban artists are representing Locobano without resorting <laughs> to some variation on an established fixed group of icons, such as the map of Cuba, the Cuban flag, makeshift boats and rafts of emigration, the ruins of Havana, Jose Marti, Chip. Marti, Che, and symbols of Afro-Cuban religions, among others. But tonight, we're not going to be talking about Cuban art, as wonderful as it is. We're here to hear a discussion between artists Wafa Bilal, Andrea Geyer, and Dred Scott. This exploration of the ethics of socially engaged art will be moderated by Tom Finkelpearl, Executive Director of the Queens Museum of Art and Board Member of A Blade of Grass, we are proud to say. After the program, please have your first or second glass of wine and continue the conversation and enjoy the exhibition. And when you have a chance, this is a, a personal uh, moment, when you have a chance, take a walk down the block to the Rubin Museum of Art, founded by Donald and myself. We believe that art should be a part of everybody's daily life, so we filled 17th Street with art-going possibilities. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Tom. Uh, thanks, Shelley, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I, I think that the genesis of this was one of those side conversations. And actually, I said this at the Creative Time Summit, but I'll say it again, that the side conversations are often the most interesting and the most profound when you're sort of talking about something. So we were, Andrea and I were sitting uh, at an event, and Pablo Hoguera was, was, was a book launch, and uh, Deborah was sitting across the way. and and. Pablo, is Pablo here by the way? He's a great friend and I love Pablo and this is not critical of Pablo at all. But Pablo said, well, in discussing this socially engaged art, I don't want to get into ethics. And we're like, well, what, what do you mean? And you know, I think we looked at each other and, and across the room and we all said, well, why not? You know, why shouldn't you talk about ethics? Uh, and I think now, a couple months later, then Deborah said, well, let's actually talk about it. <laughs> and so we're here tonight because of a side comment or a glance or whatever it was. So uh, we're, well, the way we're going to do it is uh, that each of the artists is going to talk about one work of theirs and talk about that in relationship to ethics somehow. But I wanted to just put my own cards on the table at the very beginning. So I, uh, if you think about the difference between morals and ethics, and morals is maybe something, a deeply held personal <laughs> view or something that is seen to be sort of a, an eternal truth versus ethics, you think of an ethics violation uh, is not necessarily a moral violation. So you could say that, let's say you're a lawyer uh, and you don't, you believe profoundly that it's wrong for one human being to murder another human being and you're, you're called upon to defend a murderer who you know to be a, a, a guilty of murder. It, it's probably an ethics violation De depending on what kind of lawyer you are and what position you're in, not to defend that person, right? So the difference between ethics and these sort of social rules that, that rule, uh, you know, uh, within government, you think of ethics violations in government are not necessarily the same as moral violations. So the way that this plays out in my own personal belief system is that I'm, I sort of believe in, in pragmatism, and there's a great uh, pragmatist philosopher named Richard Rorty who said, uh, I don't believe in, in eternal truths, but I believe that I personally am just going to start from the position that I'd like to decrease cruelty, that I'm against cruelty. I don't know how many people in this room are 
against that idea. I mean, anybody for cruel treatment here? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because that's sort of funny, and everybody, of course, will say that they're against cruelty. But why not just start from the position that you're against cruelty and then see what follows from that? So that's, that's a pragmatist philosopher. It's sort of what are the practical implications of taking a person? So that's a, a, that could be seen as, as ethics without morals, right? That, that you don't have to have a moral belief system that says that, that cruelty is wrong. You just start from the position. So that's my own personal position, and I wanted to put that on the table. We're going to talk about where we stand in terms of ethics and morals, etc. But so I, we're going to go in this order, and I'm not going to introduce the artist. I think that that's often a big waste of time with these things. You either know what their work is, or you're going to be interested in what they say, and you're going to look it up afterwards. But they're going to talk about uh, an interesting work, and these are three artists that I, I really respect uh, deeply, two of whom I know uh, pretty well from the past, and one from the past. So I'd like to uh, in, invite Dred. Dred Scott is our first artist to, to begin by talking about a piece. Okay, um, and I'm going to see if it appears magically behind me. Um, and well, it looks like it's going to, so I'll just assume that it, it will. And I, I mean, what Tom, I don't know if he explicitly said, we're just basically going to talk about one work. So I'm going to talk about one work. And it's actually a, a performed piece, but um, I'm just showing a couple of slides from it, two still images. This is one. Um, it's a project called Dred Scott Decision, which was performed this past October at, at uh, Bam Fisher, which is part of uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music. And Martha Wilson actually helped produce it, which is great. Um, and so, the piece actually, I'm going to talk about the, the various components of it, but it really was a, a project that sort of looked at a country whose democracy is rooted in slavery. And so it, it had three key elements. One of them um, was there was a crowd of four nude black men, and they were controlled by uh, continually barking German Shepherd dogs. There were two dogs and their handlers that controlled them, and these dogs barked very, very loudly the entire time of the performance. And then I read from the historic Dred Scott decision, which I will read a little bit of in a bit, but it is a Supreme Court case that was uh, in 1857, um, a little bit before the Civil War in the US, and it is actually one of the most well thought out, articulated, cogent expositions for white supremacy ever written. And it's very much from the, the U.S. Supreme Court, highest court in the land, and rooted in the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the founding documents of this country. And then the, and while, while I read, I don't know if you could see the other images, it's possible to, to just change. And, um, and so I was, yeah, you can see on your right, um, I was in a suit and there was a, a presidential uh, teleprompter. <coughs> I'm looking like some figure of authority of some sort. And then there was the audience, which was the third element of the work. So the audience was an active element. We were all on the same level. Um, and the audience had to basically go through a set of stanchions and then go through the line of black men um, and sort of confront them as they went into voting booths. And they wouldn't know what was in the inside of the voting booth until they got there. And so in the voting booth, it posed a moral question to, to people. Um, and it basically said, look, would you have voted during slavery, would you have voted in a segregated election? Um, and then it proceeded to, to tell you something. And then I, I will say what that says in a bit, but I wanted to first just read a, you know, a small excerpt of the original historic 1857 Dred Scott decision um, from the Supreme Court. Four, a free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. Five, when the Constitution was adopted, they were not regarded in any states as members of the community which constituted the state and were not numbered amongst its peaceful or citizen. Consequently, the special rights and immunities guaranteed to the citizens do not apply to them. And not being citizens within the meaning of the Constitution, they are not entitled to sue in that character in a court of the United States, and the circuit court has not jurisdiction in such a suit. Six, the only two clauses in the Constitution which point to this race Treat them as persons whom it was morally lawful to deal in as articles of property and to hold as slaves. Then further down, the, the question before us is whether the class of persons described in the plea and abatement compose a portion of this people and are constitute, cons, constituent members of this sovereignty. We think they are not, and they, they are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution, 
and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at that time considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether, they emancip whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges but such as those who held the power and government might choose to grant them. It is difficult in this day to realize the state of public, and public opinion in relation to that unfortunate race, which prevailed in the civilized and enlightened portions of the world at the time of the Declaration of Independence and when the Constitution of the United States was framed and adopted. But the public history of every European nation displays it as a manner, not too, pla manner too plain to be mistaken. They had, more, they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political <coughs> relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. He was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and traffic whenever a profit, whenever a profit could be made by it. This opinion was that at that time fixed and universal in the civilized portion of the white race. It was regarded as an axiom in morals as well as in politics, which no one thought of disputing or supposed to be open to dispute. And men in every great position in society daily and habitually acted upon it in their private pursuits, as well as in manners and public concern without doubting for a moment the correctness of this opinion. Um, and so when people got into the voting booth, after sort of confronting the, the men, and sometimes they could just easily walk by them, sometimes the men sort of stood in front of them and stared at them, sometimes they laid down in front of them so that, that the audience would have to step over them. They, um, you know, as I said, were, they saw, you know, it said, you know, would you have voted during slavery, would you have voted in a segregated election, and then encouraged people to take a ballot, and the ballot had one question on it, basically, it said, or a statement and then a question. Um, that, that, and so. America enslaved millions of Africans, continued to enslave millions of their descendants after the Civil War, and currently imprisons 12% of their male descendants aged 20 to 34. Furthermore, 33% of African American men will be imprisoned during their lifetime, and many will face legalized discrimination. Neither presidential candidate plans to eliminate this mass imprisonment. A vote for either candidate implies acceptance of continuing this legacy. With knowledge and full understanding of this, I, and then fill in the blank, will slash will not vote in the 2012 presidential election. And so then people have the opportunity to take the ballot, fill it out in private, and then go into um, go out of the booth and then deposit the, the ballot in a, a voting box. And, and they also were encouraged to, if they decided to fill out a ballot, they could take a myst mystery artwork. And the mystery artwork basically had the, the text of this reprinted in the, so that people could sort of display it in their home along with a picture of the uh, historic Dred Scott, um, who brought this, the suit which the, the case was um, about. So, you know, this was really, I assume going into the work that the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, if not every single person that was attending the piece, would agree that slavery was bad and would be opposed to sort of continuing the legacy of it in some way. And many people that would come to the piece would think that the, you know, a, a country that has 11% of black men in prison, there's something seriously wrong with that. They would think that the mass imprisonment were over a million people in prison were, you know, the foreclosure the, the, uh, during the housing crisis, which, you know, felt disproportionately heavy on black people, that all the conditions and ways in which black people were systematically discriminated against, the people would have disagreed with that. And yet, in the context of the peace, there was no way through voting they could have stopped either these black men who were being, these naked black men who were being barked at by German shepherds. They couldn't stop that, and by implication, they couldn't stop the very conditions which they were probably very morally opposed to. And so, as a, an artist, I wanted to pose a question to the audience about that and have them think about that, the, the, of this legacy that exists in the present day in horrific forms that people have inured themselves to. And while many people, you know, sort of care very passionately about it, one of the vehicles and means through which they attempt to change it through voting can't do it. In fact, it actually, ironically, reinforces the, the, those very conditions. And so that's what that piece was about. And then in my work as a whole, I really try and have, you know, I, I find the world as it is is a, is a real horror um, for the great majority of humanity. And I don't think it has to be this way. And I think people can get to a radically different, far better world. But to do that, we need revolution. We need communist revolution. And 
the great majority of people, including in this country, would think that I have antenna coming out of my head if I say that, and have turned away from actually looking at and confronting what would it really take to get to a world that they themselves, in fact, the vast majority of humanity, want to live in. And that is, you know, if you're not confronting that as an, as an artist and a human being, it does pose very sharp moral and ethical questions. And I think I'm on that, so I'll stop. So, Andrea, with this next thing, yeah. Yes. To sum it up, I must say that I regret nothing. Nothing and nobody exists in this world without a spectator. That what we call consciousness, that I am aware of myself, and therefore can appear to myself anytime, anywhere, is never enough to guarantee reality. The 95th session is now open. Please proceed. Yet what is there to admit? I carried out my orders. Where would we have been if everyone had thought things out by themselves in those days? As for the base motives, the accused was perfectly sure that he was not what he called a Schweinehund, a dirty bastard in the depths of his heart. And as for his conscience, he remembered perfectly well that he would have had a bad conscience only if he had not done what he had been ordered to do. This admittedly was hard to take. When I stand before you here today, I am not standing alone. With me are many, but they cannot rise to their feet and point an accusing finger towards him who sits in the deck and cry, Jacuz! for they are gone. Therefore, I will be their spokesman, and in their name, I will unfold the indictment. Excuse me? Did you ever ask, where are the powers? Where is the legal framework on the basis of which we are acting? Who am I to judge actually means we're all alike, equally bad. And those who try, or pretend that they try, to remain halfway decent are either saints or hypocrites. For behind the unwillingness to judge lurks the suspicion that no one is a free agent. Ani Elohim. <laughs> שעדותי במשפט זה תהיה אמת, כל האמת ורק האמת. מרדר! מרדר! Just as thinking prepares the self for the role of spectator, willing fashions us into an enduring eye that directs all particular acts of volition. It is here where an action takes place, and with it, we have put ourselves in the midst of a story, a history. We act and we lose control at the same time. It is all unpredictable from here on. Um, so I showed you recently, this is a trailer of a, of a project that I completed in 2009 called Criminal Case 4061 Reverb, which is a, a project that um, uses the uh, infamous trial of Adolf Eichmann um, in 1961 in Jerusalem to help us think about uh, questions of responsibility, um, the role of law in uh, nation states and democracies, and uh, the role of philosophy and theory in the midst of, of this triangle of like 
of, of politics and law, uh, and then uh, philosophy and theory. Um, I chose this project and not a current one because I felt that it is actually a project that addresses um, questions of judgment, morals and judgment in a very interesting way. Um, what, what we're seeing here is basically the piece itself is a six channel video installation where um, the six, there are six characters um, that are, each have a screen that are hanging around you and you're in the middle of this um, thinking through uh, this historical trial. The texts that are spoken are uh, based uh, exclusively on the trial transcripts and um, newspaper articles, books that one of the uh, that the prosecutor wrote, um, Hausner, uh, and of course the some of you might recognize uh, Hannah Arendt's book Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, so the kind of um, the female character, supposedly female character, is um, Hannah Arendt, the reporter who went um, in for the New Yorker to report on the trial. Um, my work is not interested in history. Um, I'm only interested in um, how certain events that, that have happened are present in this current moment, and how I'm really interested how art can be a space where we um, recognize that these historic knowledges and uh, questions are actually around us. It's not that they are forgotten or not there or that we have to rediscover them. They're actually here, they manifest themselves in very different ways. And um, when I was working on this trial, on this project, um, if we remember the political climate at the time, it was exactly the moment where the question of torture became, uh, re was reopened in the United States. Um, and the question of a, who's responsible, the use, the role of torture, and it was totally fascinating to me to look at this very complex historical trial that went on for over a year, and I could talk for hours about the intricate details, but I won't. Um, but I'm trying to tease out that um, exactly this question of responsibility that a, an individual has within, uh, as a citizen, as a member of a community, as an employee of a government, and how individual responsibility and uh, a, a kind of moral or community responsibility kind of col collide and collapse. And how um, I was amazed by the, the discussions around torture, how um, it was obvious that the historical knowledge that is available to us through trials like the Eichmann trial um, were not really part of the discussion. Um, one thing that I also, um, is something that's very important for me in this project um, that I wanted to kind of throw out there is that um, when I showed the work, I've showed it quite a bit, and um, what a big uh, understanding for me was working on it, that to understand um, a historical situation or any or even a current situation, what is extremely important is to be able to identify yourself with all positions that are in play. It's very easy to identify with a victim, it's easy to identify with the observer, but we usually have a hard time identifying ourselves with the perpetrator, um, because that's somehow threatening to do that, because it would mean in a certain way to acknowledge the potential of violence or the potential in this case of fascism in all of us. And I think that one of the biggest problems in the discourse of fascism um, for me is that, that, and this is I think what Aaron's project also was, to remind us that the potential for this is in all of us, to demonize Eichmann, who was the head of the, um, of, uh, the SS, uh, the Department of Jewish Affairs, and responsible for, for separating the Jewish population uh, from the Christian one and to put them into the camps, um, that he if we look at him as a demon, we are already in a trap, and we are already not recognizing that um, this this potential is in us, and if we don't continuously, I mean, Freud explained that eloquently to us over and over again, is that we need to um, have an active process of considering how these seeds, what seeds in us are growing, and what seeds are not, we are kind of killing from growing. And uh, fascism is really one of that. And I think in the moment where you come out and you say, 
I, I don't have that in me. I will never be a racist. I will never be a homophobe. I will never be a fascist. That is good as a projection, but you, it's an active process. It's what Yvonne Reiner beautifully said at some point, is that all we can ever be actually is recovering. So we can be recovering homophobes, recovering racists, recovering fascists, and fascists particularly where I'm from, but because we are, we are growing up in environments that have these traces around us, and we are impacted by that uh, in the moment when we grow up um, through, through the building of our consciousness. So this project proposes um, a space in which we can, uh, hopefully viewers can consider and think through these very difficult questions of what it means to acknowledge these potential and to have an, an active process in one's life, in one's practice, in one's community to act against. Thank you. Um, so, before we go on, I just want to, so in a way, there is this question of whether we are all perpetrators, right? And in a way, I think, Dred, your piece also, I don't want to get into the discussion yet, but think about this in a minute, uh, is something of a, a a reminder of what it is that we're accepting just by going into the voting booth. And so, you know, at some level, we're all perpetrators, but I have some things to say about that. But before, go on. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with the idea of uh, the artist's responsibility in social justice. Um, in 2004, I received terrible news of the death of my brother by an uh, air to ground uh, American missile in Iraq. And for three years, I did not know what to do with that news or did not even want to acknowledge my losses. Only in 2007, I was listening to a TV interview with a soldier that sent his missile from Colorado to Iraq with absolutely no physical or psychological connection to the ground. Only then, I decided to do an art project that addressed the disconnect between the comfort zone and the conflict zone. And since I am from Iraq, living mentally and physically in these two places, I felt the responsibility to act as a trigger to establish a platform to connect people to the of these two zones, or at least the people in the comfort zone engage them in uh, a dialogue about the conflict zone. So what I did, I moved my living space into a gallery I built a robot that people could connect to on the internet and shoot at me 24 hours a day for 30 days, um, uh, shooting paintball. Everything was uh, fine until probably day 14 when I stopped receiving massive shooting. And one day I was shot at 20,000 uh, times. I would like to play this. Uh, clip now and then we'll continue the conversation. Okay, everybody, it's day 14. This has been insane because uh, what happened is it was hit deep.com uh, and the place has been completely bombarded non stop for the last two, three hours. And you could see it's absolutely a trap so much. I mean, to the point you cannot, not a single second. I cannot even, um, I cannot even keep a try, uh, keep falling, filling the pot here. And you could, you could see the gun is just, um, it just did not stop at all. I'm just gonna go inside and just, uh, it just, it's, it's absolutely insane. I mean, just non, non stop. This is, this is actually the easy way. Uh, this, this is the only, I mean, this is just the last before it didn't stop, you could see, you could see it just how brutal it is, and then we're gonna get, we're gonna take a hit here, uh, just so, so they they could see. They, we're gonna just get a hit here so they could see it. It's supplashing. See, just should they got it, they got it, they got it right here, uh, and it's just non, it's been non, absolutely non-stop for the last two three hours. And um, I think it just uh, these people come and are so disturbing, and I don't know what, why this much hate they have in in them. Um, and you, you could see, 
absolutely not stop. And this is not a simple action. This is this is a lot of people actions. Let me try. See, the gun is even run out of uh, run. The gun run out of uh, um, uh, uh, ball because it cannot keep up with, with the demand. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna fill it one more time. Um, you, can see, you cannot. Uh, he cannot. I cannot keep just keep filling him fast enough. This uh, is absolutely. And I've never seen a night like this. Uh, and. Uh, I just don't understand it. I mean, I cannot fill this fast enough. And I just wanted to get, uh, go out there and get some hits for them so they could, they could see it. I'm just gonna dare them to uh, hit me. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm gonna go in uh, uh, early. I just got hit uh, um, in, with the glass in the glass. I'm just gonna go in one more time and just held the shield for them to to hit it. Ah, oh, shit. Oh, fuck. It's so, it's so disturbing. It's so disturbing. I'm just gonna want them to hit the shield so they could see it tomorrow. What is it like, look like when it hit here? Uh, uh, they're fighting each other, of course. Uh, I just want them to hit it. So you could see, it's absolutely non-stop. It's very, it's very disturbing. There you go. Are we gonna get a hit here? Ah, uh, there you go. See, it's just, uh, there you go. Uh, we're we're getting constant here. Uh, very disturbing. Very disturbing. Uh, Dig.com. This is really disturbing. This is nonstop. I cannot keep track of this. I cannot fill these paintball fast enough uh, to, to keep with the demand. Okay, I'll let you go because I think um, I cannot do the camera and cannot do this play. So uh, I'll just uh, have to run bet uh, back and forth. Ah, see, I have to run back and forth between um, uh, the, between, <clears throat> see, see, now I'm, I'm taking hit. I'm taking hit for them. There you go. See, I mean, just, it's, it's absolutely non, non-stop. And this is so disturbing right now. Okay, okay, I, I'm gonna go in a, in a, in a safer place. Uh, very, very disturbing, but uh, I guess I, I set up the situation. I, um, uh, I cannot give up right now, and I won't give up. Uh, all right, uh, all right, gonna go and fill it back. <laughs> See this one. Uh, uh, very disturbing. Very hard. Very disturbing. Very disturbing. Okay. I'm gonna fill it. It just uh, it's empty. I was very convincing, right? Um, after being abused for a day long of uh, being shot. Uh, uh, what I decided, I decided to take a matter in my own hand and put a, a small app in front of the camera. Later on, I disconnect the gun and I pretended to be shot and fall into the floor. Uh, and then uh, the rumors online went wild uh, about being transferred into the hospital and getting hurt because of one of the shot. Then later on, I. Um, wanted to figure out where that act came from. Is it an act of desperation? I'm deceiving people while I'm trying to connect them. Where is that coming from? And I recall as a 13-year-old boy 
in Iraq, um, the state TV showed a video of um, an Iraqi soldier being captured by Iranian and murdered in front of the camera. And that act set the country wild, and so many people start volunteering, going to the war. And only when I arrived to the United States later, I discovered the entire film, that short film by, from, uh, by Saddam Hussein was a total fabrication by 007 director Terrence, uh, 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 Terrence Young. So now the image it could, could be deceiving, and what I learned from Iraq, I applied it to art. But the end of the day, was that an immoral act? Was that ethical art? And if it was, what's the ethic behind war? Thank you. So, okay. So I. I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions that come up, but maybe I wanted to ask you guys some questions, and you guys get ready for your questions from the audience. But uh, um, one, one has to do, actually, uh, maybe for Dredd, has to do with um, this question that I ask myself you know, ethically, which is, so you know, if, what are the consequences of taking a particular position, right? So it's not that, again, I don't think of what's right and what's wrong, but what, is, what are the consequences of taking a particular position? And there's a, there's a book uh, called Lincoln at Gettysburg. I don't know if you know that book. And it talks about you know, the various, the two different traditions in the United States exemplified by the Constitu Constitution, which is essentially a very conservative document, and the Declaration of Independence, which is a more progressive document. And what Lincoln was doing, essentially, and Lincoln has its own, his own problems in terms of his own relationships with racism, but he was taking the, uh, the side at Gettysburg of the Declaration of Independence over the Constitution. That's an argument that keeps going back and forth in American politics. So if you are uh, on the side of incremental change and reform, then you are in America generally an acceptor of that argument that Lincoln made or that people have made in against the Constitution for the Declaration of Independence. But it seems to me uh, that you're taking the position uh, that uh, against both of those documents at some level. And so then my question, uh, sort of ethical question, would be, if you as an artist ended up convincing people who went to your performance not to vote, and that if that vote then would subtract a significant number, let's say this went viral and millions of people across the nation didn't vote, uh, and I would assume that the people moved by that performance were, uh, generally speaking, people who are going to vote for Obama, and you helped elect Romney. What are the ethics of that, or how would you see as that as an ethical, uh, the, the uh, consequences of that action? Well, first off, I mean, you know, that would be, if millions of people consciously didn't vote in this country and it became a social question of not voting because people didn't think that either outcome was going to be in the interest of humanity, that would be a huge step forward. That would actually be profoundly destabilizing for the, the current order, and that would be a good thing. And the, the, the thing of, of being against both, I mean, I think, you know, at the time the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration were written, they were radical documents for their time, but they're historically obsolete. They're 200 plus years old, and they, you know, I mean, as, a, as, you know, as the Supreme Court you know, argue, so eloquently argued, slavery was foundational to them. That this is not something, these are not documents that are good documents. I looked at the day when they're in the dustbin of history, and so if, ethically, if people were engaged the work as a whole and felt that, that voting was actually contributing to continuing that legacy and were consciously not doing it, it became a social question, that'd be great. I, did, I think that was profoundly unlikely to happen in, and you know, it, you know, and history has proven that that didn't happen. But I mean, and, and, the, and then the question of you know Romney versus Obama, yes, they're they're different, but fundamentally they were each trying competing for being the head of the U.S. empire, and it does horrible, monstrous things in the world. And it's not like the the, the good guy choice is that good. I mean, he sits in a room and meets with his advisors every week and decides which people to murder in the world. He has a list of basically playing cards. That's the hit list of, that can be anybody, American or no, that by executive decree he can have assassinated. And then they've legally justified that and gotten vast sections of this society to accept that. 
they have drone warfare where he is actually going around and and you know sort of violating the sovereignty of other nations and just murdering I mean people like Wapa's brother you know I mean kids in Pakistan are blown to bits and so you know the, the good guy in the election isn't that good and so I think if people actually were moved to think of politics in a radically different way and their participation in the system in a different way that would have been a great thing but I think that the art was trying to do something different it wasn't as as, as it, it wasn't actually about whether people voted or didn't in a certain sense. It was posing the question of what, what do you do when confronted with this situation which you're probably morally opposed to and then thinking that, that you can solve through a particular means that you're given. Um, yeah, and I actually think that the last part of the answer was, in, in my mind, <clears throat> that sort of got around to the question at some point. But, so, and then, uh, I have a question, actually, which is a linguistic question that is uh, for uh, Wapa and <coughs> which is that, that I was told by a friend who was trying to understand the idea of accountability. And I think it, ethics and accountability are sort of somehow interconnected. And she said that, that she was having trouble translating the word accountability into, she's working with various different communities in Queens and trying to understand that. So is there a, um, a direct translation of the word accountability? And we talked about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two words, I mean, actually, I mean, mostly there's a word um, which is more here often translated as responsibility. And there's an interesting um, the discrepancy between accountability and the responsibility meaning like this kind of needing to be able to respond to um, what you're doing, to your actions. And um, there's another word that I found that is Zurechnungsfähigkeit, which is, um, is, it means basically if a person can be believed to be able to do that, which is another kind of translation which is not yeah. quite right either, but it's close. It's closer, so it's somewhere in between there. That sounds like a word. A word worth having. Yeah. <laughs> what about in Arabic? Well, uh, responsibility means how you have the moral right to respond to something, right? Mm -hmm. And in my case, as an artist, I really don't think of work. It's just like, what does that mean? Rather, what is it important? What act is important to engage? And I most often say artist is a mirror reflecting a social condition, right? And that social condition gives us the moral responsibility to respond and to engage people in whatever thing we believe and want people to engage in. So the, the context for this question about accountability actually was at the movement uh, in Queens. And a community organizer asked a group of artists who were present, who were socially active artists, that question, who are you accountable to? And that was something that nobody in the sort of art world side of the audience had, had asked. And so I, I would like to ask you guys the question, first of all, do you think that's a valid question to ask to an artist? And second of all, if the answer to that is yes, then who are you accountable to? You, yeah, yeah. you don't know I mean, I think you could ask artists anything. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I think it's a fair... They'll give you one answer. They oh, answer yeah, yeah, they we, we, we think with the, with the hive mind, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, artists are people. Anything you can ask anybody, you could ask an artist. And, and I do think that artists have a... We create disproportionate influence on society. We are intellectual. We are putting out ideas in the world, whether they're visual or, or musical or whatever. But we do, you know, the ideas in some for very small ways and in other cases very large ways if you're, you know, uh, a Hollywood director or, or an art, you know, or Richard Serra or something like that, you're, it's going to be seen by millions of people. And, and so it is, I think, very important to pose questions of, you know, who are you accountable to? And, and I mean, I, I think that, you know, Ultimately, hopefully, people will say, and I would say that, to sort of humanity as a whole, and that doesn't mean that I, 
It's not like you can easily answer that question, but I'm not, I'm not advocating for one section of people. It's like, we're not, let's not go back to identity politics where I'm accountable to my black people or my men or my artists or whatever, but it's more like, I want to get to a world where there's no exploitation and oppression. I think it's possible to do that and to contribute to building a movement for revolution to enable that to happen. It's not just a US thing, but it's part of a world process although it would take place in, in various individual countries, but that's what I, I hope to be judged by, and you know, hopefully I will be consistent with that, and my methods and aims will you know, if ask to somebody else. Somebody could say, yeah, that's true. I mean, for me, it's, it's, a, it's just an interesting, of course, combination that as artists, we're not, we're artists, we're citizens, we're, we're members of communities, and in, in that way, I'm accountable to community, to the community that I'm part of and um, in, in different layers of that. But I, I think that what's important for me is that the, this freedom we have within the realm of, um, of art making, that it, is, it offers this um, space that, in which we can come together and contemplate really difficult questions. And uh, this is not the only place uh, art can be useful, but it's an important place for me as an artist um, that it's, and I've recently talked about this uh, in this way that I'm actually appreciating that art can be a place where we can be uncomfortable. Uh, because especially with this kind of consumer mentality, it's, it's not a sentiment uh, that there's not many spaces where we can come together and be collectively uncomfortable and work through that as a community. Um, so I see that as an incredible potential within artistic practice. And for that, then, um, I feel I have a certain kind of privilege to create these spaces as an artist. And I need to make use of that privilege and need to apply a certain rigor and um, commitment to it. So in that sense, I'm accountable to exactly that space of rigor and commitment to an idea and the kind of privilege that, that I have to do that. Uh, maybe, uh, I, I think, of artists are activated by the context in which they exist in. And the idea of accountability, I don't think to me it exists, because um, what activate uh, uh, us as artists is just like what activate every uh, member of the society. But here it comes the matter of, do you really want to take the risk? And for some reason, um, through the history, artists want to take a risk and be on the front line. I don't know what's the reason, but uh, historically proven artists always there in the front line trying to activate um, the society. But there is a difference uh, between activating a society and imposing on them. Uh, to me, us as artists, uh, we're triggered for platform. Then what happens is when the society or the uh, audience participant come to that platform, whether it's physical or um, virtual, then uh, uh, through that conversation, uh, come the outcome um, uh, generated, not by the artist, him or herself, but rather by the engagement they create.